Hi, I'm Graham Boyd, and I would like to welcome you to the next 30 minutes of talking about creating a green economy from where we are now. I hope that what I'm about to say will be something that, that you can at least rent for half an hour or for the course of today's meeting, even if you don't actually buy into everything that I'm saying. In the next half hour, we'll go through the following six points. First of all, how do we integrate polar opposites into the complementary pairs that they are? Then into the six layers of a green economy. Moving on then into rebuilding what we have today towards a green economy, starting with the human layers, then rebuilding business that is inherently green how that all integrates together to rebuild towards a full green economy. And at the end, I'll say a few things, suggestions of what we can already do today. Now I'll start off by saying a little bit about myself. I was born in Africa, in what's now Zimbabwe, grew up in South Africa during the apartheid era. This is relevant because as you'll see throughout the rest of this video, I see a lot of common ground between what I saw in South Africa in apartheid and how South Africa managed to transition out of apartheid and what I'm seeing today. One of the things I will start with is during the transition out of apartheid, there were a series of meetings where all of the different parties involved across the entire transition out of apartheid South Africa into post-apartheid South Africa all came together in a very tense, at times, dialogue process. The biggest insight that came out of that dialogue process which I believe we now need to reapply globally, was that every single stakeholder group in that dialogue process, whether the African National Congress, the South African Communist Party, the representatives of business, civil society, the at that point ruling National Party, all of them realized that at the end of the day, their image of the ideal South Africa they wanted to achieve had huge amounts of common ground. They were very aligned on what they stood for. The big differences were what they were against and on the strategy that they thought would get them what they stood for. By the end of the dialogue process, every single stakeholder group had realized that the strategy that they thought would get them to what they wanted and some of the principles of what they were against would prevent them from getting what they stood for. They realized that even though each stakeholder group came in with what appeared to be opposing needs, they actually needed each other to get there. None of these strategies or groups could get there alone. So the first idea that I would like you to rent for the duration of today is that so many of what we think are polar opposites that should never come together, like altruism and self-interest, might in a green economy be complementary pairs that are inherently inseparably part of the same whole. An easy way of seeing that is to think perhaps of your own body, your biceps, pull this way and work against the bone. Your triceps pull that way, working against the bone. They look as if they are polar opposites, bone, bicep and tricep. But to have a viable working body, 
they are inseparably part of the same arm. And it's precisely in their opposition that your body has strength and integrity. Imagine that the same might be true in many of the different areas of what are currently showing up as opposites, as enemies. And that leads into what I believe is one of the single most powerful and important paradigms to create a viable green economy where we can all thrive, where all life can thrive, which is the paradigm of multi-solving. Finding single actions that solve multiple problems simultaneously in one go. I first came across multi-solving, watching and reading some of the YouTube videos and talks of Elizabeth Sowen. And one of the examples she gives of multi-solving is something that it has taken root in some Japanese factories where they put in a green wall or a green curtain which simultaneously cleans the air in the factories, cools the factories down, reducing their energy usage and cost for air conditioning, and grows vegetables that the staff then eat in the canteen. Now, that to me is a perfect example of one action putting in a green wall, solving multiple problems. In addition, I have no doubt that having green plants in the factory environment has a superb positive impact on everybody's mental health. When Jack and I started writing Rebuild, the complementary opposites, sorry, the complementary pairs, the polar opposites, were a core part of what we needed to actually write Rebuild, to build the toolkit. What we realized as we started talking was that both of us had interests in science, physics, and art. And we realized that the big breakthrough that both Picasso and Einstein made was exactly the same. Both of them realized that we needed new ways of seeing the world. Quantum mechanics is a new way of seeing the world that sees what physics had previously seen as opposites that could never come to bear together, seeing those opposites as complementary pairs that were inherently one and the same. And similarly with Picasso, he realized that if he actually wanted to paint a horse, it was not enough to paint the image of the left side of a horse. What he really needed to paint was something that might not actually look like the left side of a horse, but that really captured the essence of hoarseness. Again, he needed not just a new lens, but he needed multiple new lenses to capture hoarseness in an image. This is what I believe is essential if we are to build a green economy, that we begin using new lenses and multiple lenses simultaneously so that we can see simultaneously, like a Picasso image, all of the relevant aspects of hoarseness or greenness. One of the biggest insights that physicists had over a century ago was realizing that if after repeated attempts to solve a problem, you were getting no closer to a solution, then most likely your problem statement itself is part of the problem and you needed to rephrase it. I think that this is one of the challenges that we have today, that we need to reframe the problem that we're trying to solve. What I have found very powerful as a restatement of what it is that I'm dealing with is to shift from saying that this is a problem and we need to fix it into saying that this is more like a child growing up. A two-year-old child 
is a mystery growing up into what it can become. And the job of the parents is to provide the appropriate container and processes to explore the mystery and to nurture growth. To my mind, this is a very powerful lens to look at what we're trying to do today through. What we're dealing with is not a simple logical problem to solve, where if we do this, then exactly this will happen and it will fix the problem. Far rather, in building a green economy, we need to look at it more like a garden, as a mystery that we are exploring to uncover what are the right conditions to put into place for the garden to grow itself. Moving on to what is an economy. An economy is absolutely not what neoclassical economic theory limits it to. An economy is far more than that. The way that Jack and I describe the economy in our book is that it's a tool to provision. It's a tool to do the job of moving a capital from where it's abundant to where it's needed. In that sense, there are many different economies around, just as there are many different capitals around. If you think of the six capitals in the Integrated Reporting Initiative, you have natural capital, you have human capitals, you have relationship capitals, you have manufactured capitals, you have intellectual capital, and you have financial capital. All of those capitals have economies. I find it very helpful to learn from nature. Nature itself is an economy. A natural ecosystem is a natural economy. And if you think of the capitals in there, one of the biggest capitals in there is the whole capital of life. And life depends on energy. It's very helpful, I find, to look at energy as the currency that nature uses to run the economy of life. So if you look at it this way, then our financial economy is clearly a subset of human society and very clearly a subset of nature. So if we're going to build a green economy, I believe we need to build a green economy that is aligned and works to support the thriving of all of life across all six layers here. Obviously, it needs to work at the global economic level for the entire planet's natural ecosystem. Equally, it needs to work at level five at the local economy and local natural ecosystems. And then at the largest human scales, it needs to work between companies and between stakeholders. The economy needs to work for the staff of a company, for the families of the employees, for the cities that the companies are based in, for the nation states, as much as it needs to work for the investors, for the customers, for the suppliers. It needs to work for all of the stakeholders at the level four intercompany, interstakeholder level of the economy. And then at level three, it needs to work within the company, inside each company as well. You have an economy across multiple capitals. Human intellectual relationship, human energy is a key part of that economy. So the way you build, design a company needs to work for all. It needs to work also at level two, the relationships between people, and at level one. Each of us inside, we have our own inner personal economy. And you know your personal economy is in a good situation if you're filled with energy and life and you can do the things you want to do. And your inner economy is in a dire state, maybe in deficit, if you lack the energy to do what you need to do. And so 
if we are going to build a global economy that is completely green and works, we need to make sure that it is green and works for each of us, each of our individual economies. And those are shaped by our unique experienced reality. I suggest rent the idea that there, none of us experiences the same reality. None of us is living in the same reality. Each of us is actually living in a slightly different or maybe radically different reality. But all of our realities are different lenses on the same bigger global whole. And that if we can integrate those and work together, if we can find ways of interacting effectively, then we will be able to structure policies, laws, institutions, cultures, beliefs, values, where we can recognize that each of them are different complementary lenses on the same whole. This is one of the biggest barriers to the tough conversations that we're having difficulty getting through to a conclusion, this difficulty of really engaging. And I strongly recommend reading this book, Breaking Through Gridlock. It's an excellent book by Jason Jay and Gabriel Grant, and it talks about the different inner motivators that we all have. Some of the most important motivators that need to be met in any viable economy for human beings to function in are motivators like autonomy, belonging and relationships, mastery, the space to be able to express fully who you are through your work and your life, the ability in your work and what you do to do things that you enjoy because they use your skills and get you into flow. All of that is an inherent part of a green. So we've just touched on layers one and two and what needs to be included there for them to be a viable part of a green economy. Now let's move on to layers three and four. The building box of an economy that we call the incorporated company are fictions in a sense. They are inventions of human beings over the past four centuries. We've invented them to solve the problems that we needed to solve 400 years ago. We need to solve different problems now. To grow a green economy, it is imperative that we reinvent the company. Now, the company was invented 400 years ago to solve the problem of trust. How do you get people with money who are not part of the same family to trust each other over a long period of time to put significant amounts of their wealth into a collaborative endeavor? In other words, a company is part of an economy because it's just a tool that does the job of providing financial capital, moving it from where it's abundant to where it's scarce. The problem that we're facing now in the world, or let's say the mystery that we're trying to explore, is the mystery of how do we function in a way that is fully regenerative. And for me, fully regenerative means that every single company we incorporate needs to be incorporated around all of the capitals it touches, not just financial capital. It needs to grow all of the capitals it touches, not just money. So any company that has human beings in it needs to grow human beings, as we discussed a few moments ago. Any company that touches in any way nature needs to put back more natural capital into nature than it takes out. Any company that touches intellectual capital needs to generate and give back more intellectual capital than it sucks in. Now, the beauty of almost all capitals except for money is that the more you work with them, 
the more you can grow them. Nature is enormously profitable in terms of natural capital. You plant one acorn that turns into one oak tree and generates millions of acorns of excess profit beyond the one acorn that it needs to return to stay at one acorn to one acorn over the course of its lifetime. Nature is highly adaptive. It's fully autopoetic, which means that it is fully alive. It is able to decide in a sense for itself when to give birth to offspring and when to die itself. We need companies that do the same thing. It is time to incorporate, as I describe in the book, the Fair Shares Commons style of company. Incorporate companies as a commons, inclusive of all of the capitals that the company touches, where all stakeholders who represent those capitals have voting rights in the annual general meeting. In other words, all capitals have a role in governing the company. That ensures that when decisions are taken, decisions are taken in the general meetings that take into account the needs of the entire system, because our entire global ecosystem is represented within each company. It means that the company can be truly redesigned as an engine to grow all capitals, not just money. And if you do that, it enables you to take care of levels one and two of an economy, the human levels. And it means that companies are fit for human beings to, to be in, to work in, because human development is as much part of the purpose of the company as it is to, for example, manufacture and sell washing powder or to deliver a profit to investors. Only if we incorporate companies like this where all of the stakeholders are part of the governance of the company, will we be able to create circular economies? This inclusive way of incorporating is essential if we're to create the circles that are the foundation of a green economy, of any regenerative economy. If you think of the circle depicted over here, you need trust over decades of the entire circle's operation from company one through company two to company three. <clears throat> that trust between stakeholders, the representatives of all capitals, happens best if we simply replicate for all capitals what we've done already and proven works so well to generate trust between the investors of financial capital. Namely, that all of them have a role to play in governing the company, in taking the big decisions that affect the whole, and that all of them have some kind of reward, some kind of return on their investment. This one, having governance power, gives them security. It meets their need for safety. Having a reward, enables them to also meet their needs across a range of other areas. If we incorporate in a way where companies one, two, and three in this circle are all part of each other's general meetings, each of the companies has governance power in each other in a way that balances out the risk of the company being captured for the narrow self-interest of one stakeholder group, then company one can take the decisions that will make life better for the system as a whole, make life better for the entire planetary ecosystem, because company one knows that companies two and three cannot 10, 20 years down the road exploit that interest in their own narrow self-interest. The financial investors of company three can't extract money out of that company that is only there because of the investment that company one's investors made 20 years earlier in a better operation. We must, if we are to create a green economy, 
incorporate in ways that are fully green from the individual human level through to the whole incorporated company. And that means that each company is not a closed, walled off entity. It means that it is interacting with all of the other companies and stakeholders around it at the governance level and at the wealth share level. Now, the good news is in pretty much every country in the world today, companies like this can be incorporated. In some jurisdictions, you can incorporate this as one single company. In other jurisdictions, you may want to have a number of companies that together form one operating entity. For example, you could have one separate company for investors, along with a company that is incorporated as a foundation or a trust that preserves the integrity of the values. One of the things that's essential in this kind of company is that it preserves the values of the company, that it takes into account, for example, the needs of the next seven generations in taking big decisions that might affect society and the environment. By doing this, we can create a green economy. Green because it's green like nature is. It's inclusive of everything. It recognizes even that parasites are an essential part of a functioning green economy. First and foremost, we need to use the lenses of all capitals so that we shift from thinking of the economy as simply something that is about money small c capitalism into something that is about all capitals, all currencies, big c capitalism. If we do that and we have the kind of all stakeholders, all capitals governance in each company and the interlocking of each company with each other, we will also shift from extractive capitalism, what's sometimes called rent seeking capitalism, where the owners of the company charge the employees rent to have the job to generative, regenerative, big C capitalism. If we do that, we will have a truly green economy in the same way that nature is a fully functioning green ecosystem. Doing that is going to be filled with bringing what appear to be polar opposites together into what they truly are, which is complementary pairs. We need to recognize that the whole concept of trying to own a company is akin to trying to own all of the people inside the company. And that just as slavery was a completely dysfunctional basis to build a viable human society on, so too is owning a company a dysfunctional basis for building a viable, thriving green economy on. Equally, we need to recognize, like in South Africa, all of the iniquities of apartheid emerged because stakeholders were separated away, prevented from engaging in governance and wealth share. In South Africa, if you had a white skin, you had governance rights and a share of wealth. Well, today, the way we incorporate has common ground. If you're lucky enough to have money, you have governance power in each company and a share of the wealth generated. We need to move to inclusive companies. We need to remove these apartheid like elements in the way we incorporate that exclude all but one capital, exclude all but one class of stakeholder. And another interesting paradox that comes out of that is that that then leads to an end point where in a green economy companies become truly free legal beings rather than being treated as property or as tools it leads to a world where there is actually less need for regulation than there is today because there's a microcosm of the entire global ecosystem inside each company so you shift from this power struggle between all of the different stakeholders being exercised in an adversarial degenerative way through courts of law 
into a green natural economy where the complementarity between the different forces is seen, where it becomes very much like my biceps and my triceps. They work against each other and against the bone, but all three are needed for me to have a viable arm that I can use to put food into my mouth. And so in closing, I would say that there has never been a better time to rebuild. There has never been a better time to build a world that works for all. In other words, there has never been a better time to build, or maybe better said grow, a green economy. There is a lot that you can already put into practice today to build a green economy. You can begin working at level one already what you've been doing in the past half hour, what you do in the rest of the day. Look at how can you understand, explore the mystery of your own internal energy economy. How can you grow it? As you interact with each other, both as human beings and also as you interact at level three, working together to deliver results, put into practice modern ways of increasing the humaneness of your interaction and the effectiveness of working together. A book I strongly recommend reading is this one, Many Voices, One Song, The Shared Power with Sociocracy. That I find is one of the superb ways at level three of creating a fully green way of working together and at level two way of interacting with each other. Clearly at level four, if you have the ability to start up a new company in the near future, I strongly encourage you to explore the Fair Shares Commons as a way of incorporating. That again is a way of making it inherently green. If you can start up an entire set of companies that are all interrelated, if you can transform an existing company into a Fair Shares Commons, again, those are small practical actions that you can do in the near future. The more of these that get done, the more the level five, the local economies, will become steadily more and more green. And that will lead inexorably at level six to the global economy becoming fully green and growing the planet's natural ecosystem. There is a wealth of material also in this book by Daniel Christian Weil, Designing Regenerative Cultures. And I can wholeheartedly recommend your reading that book as well. If you want to connect with Jack or myself on Twitter, head off to Graham Boyd PhD on Twitter, Prof Jack Reardon on LinkedIn, and I would strongly recommend that you buy a copy of our book, Rebuild, a toolkit for builders of a better world, or download the PDF from the website in the link on this slide. Thank you very much for listening to me. I hope that you have at least been able to rent some of these ideas, play with them and see where they take you even if you don't buy into everything or anything that I've said. Enjoy the rest of your conference.